Fantastic. Thanks. So thank you very much for having me and thanks for coming and listening to what I have to say. I, I, um, this presentation is set at a relatively introductory level, so uh, there will be some of you that have more IP savvy than others, but uh, I'm going to be talking about, I'll give a summary in, in, a, in a moment, but I'll be giving an overview of various different IP rights. There really are quite a lot of different forms of intellectual property. And I'll be giving the, the presentation a bit of an agriculture flavour. I know that the founders work in diverse areas and certainly I hope that it will be accessible and informative you know, regardless of what technology area you might be focused on. But my background is agriculture and obviously there is a lot of agricultural innovation going on regionally, including in Armidale. So uh, without further ado, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our firm, a bit of marketing to start off with, then my background and how I got into uh, doing what it is that I do today, a general overview of, of IP and its value, talk a little bit about uh, specific types of, of IP and, and how they may be useful and when you might um, seek to, to rely on them commercially. Uh, so that will include trade secrets, copyright, uh, circuit layouts, trademarks, registered designs, PBR, plant breeders rights, and then patents, which I'll focus on a little bit more uh, extensively because that's mainly what I do and it's a, you know, we do a lot of work protecting inventions using, using patents. Uh, I'll run through a couple of case studies and uh, a few final take home messages and take questions. So IP Gateway, uh, there's been a lot of changes in the, in the IP profession within Australia. I won't go into it, but as a result of some of those changes um, and us remaining independent, we've grown really substantially over the last 10 years. Currently have nine attorneys across a range of technology areas, uh, including biotech, which is my area, biochem, mechanical and electrical engineering, ICT, we do trademarks, registered designs. I have done a lot of plant breeders' rights as well in my time. Um, we have a good life science team with four research PhDs and we have a lot of experience in drafting sophisticated uh, patent specifications around sophisticated technologies, including biotech and ag tech. My background, initially I did an undergraduate degree in med science, so I was aspiring out of school maybe to be a medical doctor, but ultimately decided that I, I didn't want to go down that path uh, and spoke to, um, I grew up in Lismore and spoke to a regional professor there who had a plant biotech centre, a guy called Rob Henry. He took me on for honours, I did a PhD, then worked at CSIRO on an industry funded project for quite a few years. Joined the profession, the IP profession in 2014 and as part of my training did a Masters of IP Law and then have more recently joined the current firm. So my honours and uh, PhD projects were based around identifying the genetic cause of fragrance in rice, jasmine and basmati rice, as you probably know, have this sort of popcorn-y aroma and um, Rob Henry and the team have done some really good uh, work in identifying the likely genetic cause in terms of you know how it was inherited and where it might map to on a particular chromosome. I had the great you know uh, privilege and I was very lucky to rock in for an honours project not really knowing what research was or what it involved and just so happened that I was largely in the right place at the right time and identified by com sequence comparison to the recently released um, non-fragrant rice genome sequence. We did some resequencing of a fragrant variety and lo and behold identified what could likely have been the uh, mutation that caused that fragrance aroma and subsequently it's been established that that is the case. Um, I must say that that was about the most satisfying, well it's certainly my research outcomes were never so straightforward ever again. It was very much a one-off, uh, you know, fortuitous kind of uh, outcome. But my PhD looked at the role of um, this mutation was actually an inactivation of a gene called a betaine aldehyde dehydrogenase gene. And these genes are implicated in um, abiotic like drought and salt stress tolerance. And so we were like, well, hang on a second, this has been knocked out. Is it doing anything to the fragrant rice's ability to tolerate stress? And my PhD was, was around exploring that. And ultimately we found that there was an association there. 
Um, and I guess uh, part of that process was that we uh, worked with some patent attorneys to get patent protection around not only the fragrance gene, but then this relationship. And that was my sort of first introduction um, in detail to IP at that point. But then I went on and did five. Well, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty exciting uh, at the time, and uh, but yeah, it was, I guess, a really good example of how, at the time, genome sequencing. It was still early days, and there was a lot of people saying, "Oh, this is all a bit of a novelty, and well, what's the point of this? You know, how much is it? How instructive it's, is it going to be?" And it was a very good example of leveraging that tech to get a really significant outcome. So, um, I worked on disease resistance then, uh, specifically focused on um, improving resistance to a fungal pathogen called Fusarium pseudograminarum, which causes crown rot, very significant um, wheat disease in particular, it affects barley too. And again, it was a, a sort of a genomic approach to attempting to improve resistance. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was a very interesting project, uh, it had its challenges, but I certainly don't regret my involvement anyway. So yeah, I've got a lot of experience in agricultural research, both in the lab and then you know in the glasshouse, and also to a to an extent in the field. And as a result of that, my I guess as a patent attorney, I have focused a lot of my practice around protection of ag IP. So with that background, uh, what is an intellectual property? Well, intellectual property is, you know, it's a whole lot of different um, bundles of, of rights that are covered by, you know, this one um, uh, quite broad term. And, and really at its most general level, IP is any idea, discovery, invention, mark, scheme, concept, you know, a way of performing a task. That's a result of human intellectual activity. We're all producing IP every day, most of it not commercially valuable or at least doesn't get um, deployed in that way and doesn't go on to be commercially valuable. But uh, it, it really does broadly encompass um, any human intellectual ingenuity. Um, it's intangible, but you can register at least some IP rights, which basically provide a tangible presentation of an otherwise intangible right. So you can get registered patents, registered designs, registered plant breeders rights, you can have registered trademarks. There's also unregistered IP that can nevertheless be commercially valuable, uh, trade secrets, copyright, circuit layouts, unregistered trademarks. You can deal with this uh, like any other commercial entity in the sense that it can be bought, sold, licensed, destroyed, um, but registration can really help to facilitate uh, commercial dealings because you can go into a negotiation saying, not just, oh, look, I've got this great idea, how about give me some money, but here's my registration, here's the priority, here is the direct path um, to which I have entitlement for this, this intellectual property. Uh, and it can be very valuable. Uh, if properly protected, the owner can exclusively have, um, have commercial benefit of that IP, can provide a competitive edge in the marketplace. You can use it to leverage relationships with potential partners. Um, it can obviously assist with you establishing your commercial reputation. And for startups, it, it's often the, the only major asset that, that uh, a startup company will have in the beginning. Um, and IP is central to many industries, including pharmaceuticals, agriculture, many others. So broadly, you can um, think of, well, IP can be defined in terms of its registered types of rights and unregistered rights. Just because of my plant background, I, you know, I tried to present this in a somewhat digestible form. If we imagine you came up with a new method for plant tissue culture, you might seek patent protection for that intellectual property. Uh, you might have a logo that you're associating with, you know, commercial sale of services or products around this method that can form registered or unregistered trademarks. Might have a, a, a stylish tissue culture tub that you're using as part of that, which could be the subject of a registered design. 
if you produce a new plant variety as a result of this process, could be eligible for plant breeders' rights. In terms of unregistered rights, there'll be copyright in a protocol pamphlet potentially that's associated with the method. Um, maybe you'll have a secret composition that you would use and, and maintain secrecy around, which uh, would represent confidential information. And if there was robotics that you used to, to um, conduct this method, then potentially there'd be eligible circuit layout rights uh, within that, that robotic system. So trade secrets, confidential information and technical know-how. Uh, you can protect it by maintaining it completely secret or if you have an appropriate regime in place, uh, then for example, a confidentiality agreement, a non-disclosure agreement, then the person that you're providing or the party that you're providing that information to will have a duty of confidence. Uh, it is very difficult to enforce uh, at times and, and it's complicated and jurisdiction specific. Um, it typically relying on trade secret, confidential information type IP rights won't be appropriate if it's for technology that's, that's easily reverse engineerable. If you have a product, once you put it out on the marketplace, if someone can take it, pick it apart, recreate it, then you don't have any other form of right. So once they know how to do it, then you know, you, your confidential information becomes useless. But on the flip side, unlike a patent right or um, you know, registered design, you can maintain it indefinitely as long as you can keep the secret. Uh, as an example of you know, Coca-Cola ingredients and uh, secret herbs and spices that, that they've been around for a very long time through secrecy. So in some situations, you can maintain a longer term of protection than you might with a registered right. Uh, and I suppose focusing more on the life sciences areas, when would people potentially use trade secret protection? Well, therapeutics companies might do it for data sets um, and analysis in a therapeutic context. Um, also as optimized formulas, compositions, um, protocols that can all represent trade secret information potentially. So copyright, well copyright is an automatic right that um, applies to essentially original artistic works using that term broadly, literature, artworks, music, films, computer programs potentially. Um, but it protects the expression of ideas, not the ideas per se. So it won't, the example I often use is you, uh, you know, JK Rowling's has copyright in the Harry Potter books uh, and it, it protects her specific way of writing the substance of that, the particular plot lines, the characters and, you know, the substance of, of that expression, but it doesn't extend to the concept of you know, a wizarding school where people go and have adventures or whatever. You, you, you won't infringe the copyright by broadly falling within that large conceptual idea. It has to be a copying of the, a substantial copying of the specific presentation. Um, it also, it's important to understand with copyright that it protects against copying, uh, not independent development. So, you know, if Gary makes a beautiful artwork and then I independently, without knowing about his artwork, make the same or substantially the same artwork, if I can establish that I did it independently, he doesn't have any claim to, to my artwork. It has to be established that I copied his artwork. Um, infringement, there's limited case law in Australia and it's as a result somewhat grey still, but generally you will, it will um, be required that a substantial part of the expression of the work is, is copied for copyright infringement to be found. Uh, typically in most jurisdictions last for seven years after the death of the creator and as an example, research papers, um, you know, product inserts in this kind of a context, agricultural context, but of course also works of art and um, you know, works of literature. Uh, Tim, yeah. Sorry, can I ask, do you like any questions or comments as you go? Like, do your whole presentation? Yeah, whatever you'd like, yeah. 
just to go back to your slide, uh, quite right. one of the things quite right, it's nice to see you measure it, measure it and unregistered. The beauty of quite right is the simplicity of the sentence. Mm. You don't have to do very much to get it. But the, the one thing that people often miss is it's multi layered. What I mean by that is if you can think of a movie, the script of the movie has a copyright. The movie itself has a copyright. The soundtrack has a copyright. You release it in French, has another copyright. So within one little right, all of a sudden, you can actually have 50 different legal rights. Each one is commercially viable to sell off. And yeah, so, yeah. If you know the author Graham Greene, very famous for giving birthday presents, the copyright of the third man in Arabic in the East Asian region. Now, that doesn't sound very good, except for what we sell 10,000 books, and yeah, that value is really important. The other informing thing, obviously, this is the academic, is that you mentioned the uh, creator, the real copyright issue is always around publishers. So, in other words, J.K. Rowling is hiring to copyright in her work, all the money goes to the publishers, and they have different copyright as well. Remember. So, it's a very sophisticated area, very complex area. And the shortest title ever to be copyrighted is The Man That Worked Back in Monte Carlo. That's the shortest phrase. Interesting to know, yeah. Thank you. It's interesting input to have. Um, so, moving on briefly. Um, uh, circuit layout rights. So, quite a specific area uh, based on copyright principle. Uh, apply to integrated circuits for computational equipment, um, generally in the form of a 2D representation of 3D location of components automatically uh, eligible, similar is for copyright. Uh, so there's some criteria, must be commercial use, use within 10 years of creation, maximum protection is 10 years from first commercial use. This, this is at least in Australia. As an example, agricultural drone hardware could potentially have circuit layout rights within it. So a trademark, uh, generally a trademark is a sign that is signifies the source of trade, serves to identify a trade source of a product or a service. Uh, trademarks are registered in classes for particular goods and services. Um, and generally speaking, and, and certainly within Australia, there's a requirement uh, for ongoing validity that you use the trademark for the particular class of goods and services that it's, it's registered for. So if you register uh, a trademark in a particular class and ultimately you don't use it for that class of goods or services, then it becomes susceptible to um, removal from the register for non-use. A requirement to be registered is that it's distinct from other marks on the register um, for the same or similar goods and services. It shouldn't be descriptive or at least it's it's more difficult to register if it's descriptive of the goods and services claimed and quite often with clients we find that um, people may adopt a, a trademark that's quite descriptive of what they're doing but that gets difficult when you're trying to get through registration because the office will typically argue that you know you are not entitled to have a monopoly around this term that is descriptive of what you're marketing. Other, other uh, traders may want to use this in a descriptive sense for their goods and services. So depending on whether a trademark has been developed by a client, we'll typically recommend avoiding descriptive trademarks. If you think of something like Google, which has become an incredibly strong trademark, it's got certain connotations. I believe it's was related to the Google Plex number, which is a big number, and but it doesn't, prior to Google becoming Google, it, it didn't have any uh, specific meaning, and so it became a highly effective and defensible trademark for that reason. Uh, trademark protection, you can register for 10 years, uh, at least again in Australia, and it's renewable forever in 10 year blocks, although it does become susceptible to removal if you're not using it for the goods and services that you've, that you've registered it for. So registered designs, uh, a design registration is important to understand relates to visual appearance of, of a product 
uh, so shape, configuration, pattern, ornamentation that gives a, or contributes to giving a unique appearance of your product. It's, and it's intended to protect visual appearance, not function. If you're looking for functional protection, then pattern protection is what is designed for that purpose. Um, and in fact, again, there's limited case law in Australia and it does get the overlap between form and function can at times be, be difficult to tease out, but theoretically at least, if something is key to the function of a class of products, functional products, then you, should not, you shouldn't be able to get extensive, um, uh, an extensive monopoly around that particular feature because it will be precluding due to the inherent requirement of that feature for function of the article, precluding other people from, from using it in a functional way. Um, initial term of protection offered by design registrations five years, renewable for five further years, and that's the end of it. And when we are doing registered designs, it's in, probably uh, useful to note that, so this is a registered design for a harvester body, um, but the way that it's done with these dotted lines, uh, basically the, the, the dashed lines are excluded from the scope of protection. The protection is um, focused around this panel here. So um, registration of the design for this panel in the use of a harvester is, is focused around this. If, if a third party copies that aspect, regardless of what this dashed line part looks like, then they're potentially infringing your registered design rights. Plant breeders' rights, so they're used to protect new plant varieties. You must be able to demonstrate that the variety within, within the scope of the requirements is distinct, uniform, and stable. There can be some variation from generation to generation with a certain amount of off types and things like that, but there has to be stable inheritance of, of you know, the distinct uniform form of your variety. It can apply to both conventionally bred and also genetically modified varieties, although GM plant breeders rights aren't commonly used currently, in, at least in Australia. Uh, provides an exclusive commercial right to the variety. Uh, it also provides certain rights in harvested material and, and products from a uh, plant variety. Provides up to 20 years of protection for, around that variety or, or 25 years for certain uh, trees and vines. And importantly, if you're seeking to get registered plant breeders rights for a variety, you must file an application no later than one year uh, of first sale in Australia and within four years of, in most cases, uh, first sale overseas. So once that window is over, then you can't obtain uh, valid plant breeders rights. This is an example. Uh, the pink iceberg rose was originally developed by a, a, an Australian woman who identified a pink mutation in a white iceberg rose and then um, produced a variety from, from that uh, off type, uh, obtained PBR protection, and then later down the line, hybrid varieties were developed and protected, including, that's the original variety there. There's a new variety, Brilliant Pink, and a, a darker one, Burgundy. So one uh, important uh, issue to be aware of with PBR protection, which has come to light recently, is you need to be careful about what you use as the variety name in your registration versus how you're marketing it and what you might use for a trademark. So you have to provide a variety name for a registered variety, uh, but you're free to market your variety using any different name. You don't have to use the registered variety name. And in fact, under the circumstances, it's very important that you don't use that variety name to do your marketing because the variety name, PBR registration protects the variety name, but it's a limited scope of protection. It lasts only as long as the PBR registration. So in this case, uh, if most people will be familiar with Sir Walter, quite well, heavily marketed, well-known and commercially successful variety of, of grass. The, the um, 
the applicant and the people responsible for producing that Sir Walter variety, they registered it as Sir Walter grass and they did a huge amount of marketing around that Sir Walter name. But after the 20 years of uh, PBR protection, that, that variety and also that name, because it's considered directly descriptive of that variety, go into the public domain. So in this case, the Sir Walter people expended huge amounts of money marketing, okay, Sir Walter, fantastic grass, this is the best grass, and, and it was highly effective during that term, but now they've, they don't have, they've lost that IP because anybody can market their, their Sir Walter variety under the name Sir Walter. Uh, so they obviously at some point during the 20-year term, term of protection <laughs> went, oh, oh, this is not a good situation, we're in here, and got into to and fro with the patent office and ultimately it was settled in federal court. But as was expected, it was held that you, know, you cannot register, you can't later register a PBR variety name as a trademark. So the take home message is that if you're developing PBR, give it a code name, ABCD123 and don't do any marketing under that variety name, market it under your, your trademark. So patents. Patents can offer protection uh, for new products and processes. Uh, a patent specification has a whole bunch of information in it, but it will conclude with a series of claims. And the protection and the scope of the protection of a patent is dictated by the scope of the granted claims. It's important to, to understand that a specification can, can say all sorts of different things, but ultimately what rights that that specification confers uh, is dictated by what these claims say. And patent protection is, is a negative right. You can think of the scope of the claim or each individual claim as a fence around subject matter um, which the patentee uh, can stop other parties from from doing, so they can't go inside that, that fence. But patent protection doesn't confer an absolute right for a patentee to work the invention either. And uh, it's, when I was first getting into IP, this is one of the things that tied me in knots a little bit, but it makes sense if you think of, you can have patented technology that's built on other patented technologies. You can, you can establish patent protection that incorporates other protected intellectual property. It just goes above and beyond that. So if I, have, if I obtain a new patent that incorporates someone else's patented technology, they're not free to use my new patent, but I'm, neither am I free to use my technology because to do so I'd be infringing their, their patent. Um, did I talk about, oh yeah, so uh, some core requirements for obtaining patent protection um, are that the, the scope of the, everything within the scope of, of a claim to be granted must be novel, which just means essentially the exact same thing hasn't been done before, must be considered inventive, um, that's a, a legal test, there is some variation from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as to how it's assessed, but um, I, what I tell my clients normally when we're talking about it is if you can establish that there's some advantage um, associated with your subject uh, material, subject matter that goes above and beyond, you know, what's out there in the public domain and particularly if it wouldn't sort of be reasonably expected or it wouldn't directly follow from what's out there, then you've got a fairly good shot at establishing inventive step. The other maybe less spoken about um, requirement, at least you know, in general conversation for patent protection, is this, this uh, requirement for support or sufficiency. Essentially at the heart of the patent uh, concept is that you're getting a limited term monopoly around intellectual property in exchange for providing a description of your invention that will, after the term of your protection, allow other people that have the relevant skills to work that invention fully. So you're, you're, you're giving it to the public ultimately in exchange for a limited right. 
Um, and uh, sorry, I whacked the button here. So yeah, that, that comes down to this quid, quid pro quo concept. You, the requirement, you have a requirement that the specification fully describes the invention. Um, again, the requirement does vary a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but essentially the disclosure of your specification should enable uh, a person with the relevant skill in, in that technology area to work that invention across the full scope of the claims. Um, and it's important to know that even if you've carved out subject matter that's considered broadly novel and inventive, you may not obtain protection for that across the whole scope of a claim if uh, an examiner says, well, fair enough, you know, this hasn't been done before, but I'm not convinced that what you've described and what you've shown in this application will actually allow a, a person with requisite skill to, to work this throughout everything that could possibly fall within the scope of this broad claim. And so we do run into difficulties, particularly in certain jurisdictions. Europe is one where, you know, it, it, you might have something that's quite fundamental and might be really great innovation, but, you know, in my, in my area, maybe, okay, well, they've shown that it works, but only in certain classes of plants and, and hasn't been done in any plant. But the degree to which you can obtain broad protection, you know, it, it's a challenge because the, the examiner will come back and say, well, sure, sure, you've shown it in a model plant and a Arabidopsis or something and maybe related species, but I don't buy that it's going to work in that way across all plants. So. Um, Please do. One is, uh, it's quite a use of patent, just like there's heads around it, it's not patent. Patent, right? Yeah. Oh, wrong. <laughs> the reason it's wrong. wrong. No, no, there is a reason. The word comes from clients. Clients have dress patents, and that's how they were designed, they were registered, and they became a world monopoly. So your clients put in a design, so your crest of arms was a patent and got vested rights. So you're thinking it like somebody has a drawing of clothing. That you see now in words, because that's where and we're talking a very old, very logical thing. The other great thing about patents is they introduced pen patents or, or, or ones we have a short term invention. So the word was used, a great example. Whereas we short life, you want to block everybody in the market, get up, you know the objects are going to disappear, and it's a very powerful tool once it's granted. Yeah, so the ones are more like great things. Sorry? Sorry. Well, yeah, it's still, it's, yeah, it's not entirely clear. They're, they're safe for now. Um, the other, the other important thing to know is that, and Australia has really become quite, um, well, somewhat unique and certainly it is idiosyncratic in this respect. We have an incredibly strict best method uh, requirement in Australia. Um, to the point where, so I guess the fundamental thing is that quite often clients will say, I've got this, this invention I've developed, but you know what, this associated thing, I'd really like to sort of keep that to myself. I don't really want to disclose that. Well, I mean, you can understand from the kind of quid pro quo concept of, of a patent that that's, that's not really what they're designed to do. And in Australia, if you, it can be shown that you withheld at the time of filing your application information on the best way to do it. You might have described a way to do it and you might allow the skilled person to, to work the invention, but you withheld something about the best way of doing it. That can lead to complete invalidation of your patent in Australia. One of the only, if not the only jurisdiction where that remains the case. So very, very risky to withhold trade secret type information related to the working of, a, of, a, of an invention in a patent application. Uh, so I guess an issue that comes up a lot, both in terms of people trying to commercialise and also researchers that are looking to publish as well as potentially commercialise, is the interaction of disclosure or use um, and the timing in, as related to patent filing. So in brief, prior to filing, you should avoid any disclosure in the absence of a confidentiality agreement and any impermissible use. So use considered impermissible in 
most jurisdictions, certainly Australia, is any public use that is, goes beyond what could be considered a reasonable trial and any commercial use. If money changes hands or even if there's an agreement to agree that money will change hands, it's problematic. So, you know, you must avoid, if you can, um, commercial use, public use beyond reasonable trial and also publication in the form of research publications, conference presentations, by and large any kind of disclosure outside of confidentiality agreement. Some jurisdictions, including Australia and also the US, offer these 12-month grace periods, but as attorneys we don't like them being relied on for a number of different reasons and you know, would only be relied on if there was no other choice. Someone comes to us and says, oh, I, I commercially use this thing or I disclose it, but I still want to get protection. Well, we'll see what we can do, keeping in mind the grace period um, provisions. But yeah, research, pub and pu research publication and patenting certainly aren't mutually exclusive. Just managing the timing is, is key. UNE will have commercialization people that you can, you can talk with uh, and, you know, essentially get that application filed before you go out and start publishing. You can prepare the research publication and the patent have the patent specification prepared in conjunction, but just do the filing before the publication. This is the, the innovation or yeah, it, well, a petty patent sometimes referred to in some jurisdictions. Not all, not all jurisdictions have this. In fact, well, there's, there's a few, but they come in different flavors and they're not, you know, there's some similarities, but it's by no means consistent. Um, there is second tier uh, patent, if you like, a shorter term, a lower requirement for difference between what's out there in the public domain very useful potentially in Australia and in Australia the threshold really is quite low for obtaining protection. You need an innovative step rather than an inventive step and, and an innovative step is really any difference that makes a working contribution to the invention. It doesn't have to be superior, it doesn't have to be non-obvious, it can be you know, blatantly obvious if you like, but if it makes a, a working contribution and it's not out there already, well then you uh, potentially can obtain innovation patent rights. Notable in an agricultural context that plants and animals themselves and methods of producing plants and animals can't be the subject of innovation patents in Australia. They can be obtained for methods that involve plants and animals as long as it doesn't result in the production of a plant or an animal. So uh, quickly, this is a rather complex slide, but there's two main pathways uh, that a client, we would normally help a client through to ultimately obtain patent protection. Initially, uh, uh, an application is filed. Often this is what's called a provisional patent application and provisional patent applications basically function as a, as a flag in the sand to say, this is my priority date for this invention. Anything that comes after, I have an earlier priority date. Uh, there's a couple of advantages and strategic reasons why we consider provisional patent filing to be desirable. Um, the first is that if you file and then you, you have the opportunity, providing that you still keep things under confidence, uh, you can explore commercially how it's going. If you think, oh, hang on a minute, I'm not actually interested in pursuing this, if you don't pursue it by way of a further application, that application will lapse unpublished and so your, um, your disclosure isn't made public. Uh, and another advantage of filing a provisional patent at first instance is you get a 12 month period within which to complete the application if, and uh, in that time you can optimize, continue to develop commercially and at the 12 month period you can add in further information that more precisely describes your ultimate commercial form of your invention. Um, these two pathways, the convention pathway, so if you were to file a first application, let's say it's a provisional, within 12 months you can file complete applications in any patents or jurisdiction specific rights. I think I I mentioned that earlier, if I didn't, I apologise, but to obtain 
patent protection in a particular jurisdiction, you need a patent in that jurisdiction. An Australian patent protects you in Australia, it doesn't protect you in the US or, or elsewhere. So in, via this convention pathway, you can file multiple um, patent applications in various jurisdictions overseas. Uh, this, or the PCT pathway is strategically and to a certain degree for cost reasons is the one that is more commonly used. Um, so from the filing of the first application, you again have 12 months to file what's called this PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty application. That PCT application essentially buys you a ticket to within 18 to 19 months of the PCT or more accurately 30 to 31 months from the first application to enter, similar to up here, all the various different um, jurisdictions that you're interested in. And the reason that that can be really, you know, beneficial is from this point on we typically at least during this period recommend that discussions commercial discussions um, be maintained under confidentiality but during this entire period you can be saying well you can be talking to potential commercial partners you can say um, I have IP and it's pending, um, they'll say, well, you know, I'm interested in, in commercialising this invention in Canada. What are you doing in Canada? We say, well, I can potentially explore IP protection in Canada. The option is open. You can talk to them about offsetting costs associated with that potentially or, you know, getting involved in some sort of a licence or even assignment agreement. And you have quite a long period to do that. Because the real, the big costs, as as you uh, mentioned, um, hit here. Uh, I mean, these there are certainly costs associated at these stages. But once you start going into, if it's a large number of individual countries, it does start to get very expensive. So, just focusing for a moment on agriculture by way of, of an example and, and also in case it's of interest to some of the, the founders more specifically, really patent protection is, is widely applicable to all sorts of agricultural technologies. You can get patents for mechanical equipment, you can get patents associated with farming methods, IT type inventions in the context of agriculture. You can, there's relatively broad scope for biological patenting in Australia. So genetically altered plants and animals are potentially patentable, improved plant or animal products, potentially patentable, biological methods, potentially patentable. Um, and yeah, I this, thought this was quite a cute figure uh, found online just showing but yeah, there's this huge scope for IP protection or patent protection specifically um, throughout the you know, agricultural spectrum. So just as a, as a case study, agricultural drones are quite, or drone technology broadly and agricultural drones more specifically are a really hot topic at the moment. Um, so unpiloted ve aerial vehicles for agricultural applications, People talk a lot and uh, indeed deploying the technology for precision agriculture quite widely. Use it for crop imaging from above, for monitoring soil crop health, to guide irrigation or fertilizer application, to guide, you know, guide disease spraying, use it for yield estimates or identifying pathogens in the field. Drones can also potentially be used for direct delivery of, for example, chemical sprays, fertilizers, you can use them to guide other equipment potentially by remote sensing and then you know, um, feedback into that equipment. It's a huge market. So a Price Waterhouse Cooper report estimated the potential global market value of around 30 billion and there's rapid uptake predicted 5 billion commercial value in 2025 number of market leaders at the moment. There's some people in Australia that are active and there really is substantial patenting activity around this area as well. Uh, so I guess just as an example of a, of a patent claim, this is not a claim that I drafted and it's not necessarily how I would draft a claim for that matter, but just to have it up there on screen, this is an accepted claim of this particular Australian application 
and it's directed to essentially a method that involves um, using a, a, a drone to collect information about crops and then to transmit that information to separate equipment in the form, form of a boom sprayer and to adjust boom spraying via the, the well, as a result of the data collected by the drone and transmitted to, to the equipment. So this type of methodology, you can also have system claims for the drone itself or the drone and the vehicle. Um, it's just an example of the type of thing that's being claimed out there. Another case study, uh, people may have heard of CRISPR-Cas technology. It's, you know, for any molecular biologist, it's been sort of seen as the holy grail for a long time. In my molecular research, you know, this idea of being able to do targeted genetic modification in things outside of microbes was, you know, as I say, the holy grail. Um, and some of my projects, if we had these tools available, would have been a whole lot easier. I can I can tell you that much. But so this technology essentially facilitates in both well in organisms of all types, eukaryotes anyway, um, and plant animals certainly using the molecular tool. Basically, you can go in and target a certain region of the genome and use this molecular construct to to splice and then repair and either knock out or insert um, genetic material at a very precise location within the genome. This, as you can imagine, has all sorts of um, applications, including human therapeutics, human animal therapeutics, certainly agricultural applications, incredibly outstandingly hard to, you know, sort of fathom really how just how groundbreaking this can be and um, as a result there's quite a lot of patenting activity and indeed some pretty tense fighting going on amongst various parties uh, about who has ownership and who which whose patents are valid or invalid or you know what the scope of the respective claims and protection should or should not be um, so a couple of the major players are UC Berkeley and the Broad Institute. Um, recently, there's a high profile dispute in the US that was won by the Broad Institute, and that has conferred them a very strong position in relation to human therapeutics in the US. But there is also a poor outcome um, for that party in Europe with a key early patent invalidated. Um, ERS Genomics is a company that's commercialising UC Berkeley Tech and Editas Medicine is commercialising Broad Institute Tech. Uh, ERS has a particularly strong agri-tech interest, so they're really trying to commercialise in that area. Just as an example, um, this is in a laboratory setting, but you can see already the, uh, how much uh, this technique has been deployed to alter crop traits. So these are various crops that have been uh, modified using this CRISPR-Cas technology, gene targets, and the, the trait that's been, been altered. So really quite a lot of activity going on in this area. And again, just as an example, we don't need to memorize the wording of this claim or anything, but the, this is a type of claim that you get around this molecular technology and this is quite a broad claim in this particular granted Australian patent around around the deployment of, of this technology to, you know, to specifically alter um, genetic material in, a, uh, in an organism using these CRISPR-Cas constructs. So just wanted to talk a little bit as a, as a uh, as another case study about, you know, agrobiotech IP protection. Now, Monsanto, incredibly divisive, controversial company with some real serious PR issues to the point where they've been bought by Bayer and then they no longer exist to stamp out that fire. Um, but with all of that aside, uh, and whether or not they're, you know, evil incarnate or whatever they, they may or may not be, 
they were certainly pioneers and they were one of the first companies to apply biotech business model that's used in pharma and things like this to agriculture whereby extremely you know extremely uh, substantial r d expenses are recouped by exploiting biological patents um so prior to 1980 monsanto wasn't really involved in agribiotech uh, in the 80s they moved towards that from 2000, they focused on crop biotech in these key crops, soybean, corn, wheat, and cotton. Um, and then if you look at some of their commercial transactions from that point on, they purchased this company, Seminus, for 1.4 billion in 2005. They purchased this sea cotton seed company for another 1.5 billion um, in 2008. They purchased another seed company for about half a billion euro. And then 2012, they were operating around sort of precision ag uh, applications and purchased a company in that space for a substantial amount. Another climate modeling uh, a company was purchased for around a billion in 2013 and then subsequently agreed to acquisition. And, and yes, yeah, certainly major PR problems, but it is an example, I mean, the reality is uh, to get into a debate about the pros and cons of IP protection or patent protection or what these companies may or may not be doing ethically or otherwise. But, um, you know, if we're going to have a situation where you have to invest hugely in research and development, well, it's, it's not going to happen unless there's potential to recoup and profit from those efforts. And Monsanto did apply that model effectively in an agriculture setting. So, I guess as a few uh, parting remarks, I hope I've made it clear that IP comes in a variety of forms, both registered and registrable and, and unregistered. Um, it's important to note that uh, IP can have, and registered IP, maybe particularly trademarks and patents, can have both direct commercial value, uh, you can get a return directly but also strategic value. And so from a business and commercialization perspective, it's, it's useful to be thinking around, you know, both that direct commercial um, value and also how it might strategically allow you to, for example, collaborate or to, you know, leverage and get access to competitors, technology in exchange for your technology, things like this. Um, as I said, registering your, your IP right where that's possible allows a tangible presentation of, of an otherwise intangible asset. So it allows me to come along to a meeting with an investor and say, this is my IP right number, this and this and this, rather than, you know, I have this great idea, please give me some money. Um, and that will typically be more persuasive. Uh, it's important to understand that there's a limited window to obtain protection in many cases. So if you don't act um, then you may not have the opportunity to obtain an IP right any longer after a certain point of time and so the, for that and other reasons I, I would always say I mean most patent attorney firms not just us but certainly us we are more than happy to have a preliminary meeting phone call with people about a new innovation and we don't charge for it uh, so we can provide at least informed advice about you know, possible approaches moving forward for an innovator to, to digest and then to make an informed decision on the basis of really strongly counsel against avoiding assumptions about, oh, I couldn't get a patent for this or, oh, my mate said patents are crap and they're no good. Like, you definitely get some actual professional advice. And yes, of course, patent attorneys uh, are evil lawyers and, and have vested interests in making money to a certain extent. But it, the other issue is that, you know, we can provide you professional advice and without obligation. So, and we're not going to, it would be highly unethical for us to lie about what a right could or couldn't do. You're free to then go and digest that and then make an informed decision. Um, Factor your costs into business planning because if you want to get patent protection worldwide, there are going to be substantial costs. And also, you know, only proceed um, 
not just because I'm a great guy and it would be nice to give me money, proceed where potential commercial or strategic value of doing so justifies the costs. Don't, you know, we get clients that might get to the stage of thinking, okay, well, which jurisdictions am I going to enter? Well, you would never enter a jurisdiction where the market is never going to, you know, recoup the costs that it's going to take to, to get protection there. Um, and, you know, be realistic about that and do, you do your due diligence and be, well, all of this is more business strategy and, and that's not our place as attorneys to advise you, but, but do it in a, you know, as comprehensive way as, as you possibly can so that you're not wasting your own money or, or your own time. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll just use the microphone just for the recording. Thank you, Tim. Um, I've ended up having to write it down so that I get, get all of it covered. If given a choice of trade sec secret or patent, which would be preferable for a startup to pursue, given that A, a patent forces your hand um, by showing your knowledge in the public domain, B, the cost of patent protection and defending your patent when compared to trade secret that isn't put into the public domain and is not declared to the open market. So you can keep that to yourself and protect yourself in markets that you may not have patent protection in. So the answer is all things being equal, if you can maintain a perpetual commercial advantage and not have to pay money to do it, then you would absolutely be crazy not to do that. Um, but the cold hard reality is that there's only very specific circumstances where that's possible. And the primary reason for that is that if you have a widget, you know, or a device, a product that you put out on the market, if it's, if it's reverse engineerable, well then I can eat your lunch straight away because you don't have any any protection beyond your confidentiality or your trade secret protection. But if you have, for example, in the case of, you know, I mean, other issues come into play because you, you for example, you can't get patent protection around a recipe. Um, but, uh, you know, even with that aside, y y even if you could, you wouldn't be advising KFC to get a patent on their secret herbs and spices because they're, they're, they've been able to, to maintain that as a secret and they've got perpetual rights and it, you know, it, it's only cost them what it's cost to, to keep it secret. So yeah, it, it's, it's really just that in many, many different cases where you've got, I mean, obviously there's so many different things you could potentially commercialize, but it's, it's more uncommon than, than common that you'll have something that you can commercially deploy that couldn't be effectively reverse engineered by a competitor. So that's where patent protection becomes incredibly valuable. Yes. You haven't talked about the Yeah. You haven't talked about the cost of you as a startup or whatever. You haven't talked about the cost of defending Yeah, sure. So costs can be incredibly substantial if you're going to court to end up well so it's a complicated situation essentially if you if i have a patent on my technology and you come along as a as a competitor and you're doing i consider you to be infringing my patent then as a first port of call i will be presenting my patent rights to you and saying these are the rights as various issues around not overplaying your hand in terms of asserting infringement, but you draw those IP rights to, to the attention of a third party that you consider as infringing. Now you have to remember that sure patents can be, if you want to put it in the way that you've put it expensive to defend, that's true but they're also incredibly expensive to fight. So ultimately no one wants to end up in court. Well, for me directly, I don't want my clients ending up in court. It doesn't do me any good. It does 
potentially um, the lawyers that are involved and the barristers are involved in fighting that out in court. There's a commercial interest in, in them having work to do that. And ultimately you do need to be able to establish and enforce your rights as applicable. But generally speaking, everyone wants to stay out of court. And so my right that I can show to you, and if you realise, well, hang on a minute, they've really got me here, most commonly what happens is that an arrangement is come to, whether it be a licensing arrangement, whether it be, you know, assignment, exchange, that sort of thing. Well, in what context? Because you have to understand that Pat... In fighting a opposition in China, China, I, I personally haven't been involved in a patent. Well, in enforcing in a court of law in China, patent rights? No, absolutely not. Um, China has been notorious for not respecting intellectual property rights, but uh, as of late, there are developments on foot, and really, you can look at the stats on intellectual property cases going to court, the outcomes of those uh, cases. China is recognising the importance of IP from a domestic point of view um, and is, has really stepped up to the plate in terms of uh, honouring IP rights. It's not a perfect system, but the other thing is too, like if you're in a domestic market, if you've got a product that you're commercialising in China, that's one question about how easy is it going to be for you to, if you end up in court, to enforce your rights. But a Chinese competitor that wants to come in and sell in Australia is precluded from doing that by uh, your Australian patent. So that's again a different set of circumstances and if you wished, I mean essentially I can ring up border security and give them, if you have a trademark right or whatever, and you say, look, this is my registered right, you collect up this material that's being imported and it's on face value, it's your right. It can be taken to court, it can be invalidated, but at face value, that's your right. So if, they, if, if a competitor, a third party, is trying to bring material into Australia, for example, well, they're going to have to come in and go through the process of invalidating your patent to do so or otherwise negotiate with, with you. Uh, if you, yeah, the, anything in the law is not simple, and, but uh, if you're implying that it's so difficult that you wouldn't bother, I'd certainly uh, take issue with that. Yeah. I'd heard in relation to Flowhive, um, one of the difficulties is that they had um, registered a patent. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, and they hadn't registered a trademark. And when they approached um, the platforms that are selling things out of China that are identical to their flow hives, that they didn't get any response from the platforms that they were contacting because it's a patent and they said that they'd, they'd had people that they know who had trademarks and they were shut down straight away um, by those platforms. So is there a differentiation between trademark and patent in that way that if you were on Facebook and you could contact Facebook and say you need to shut down these particular people selling my trademarked goods, they're more likely to respond versus... So It is very anecdotal question. It, yeah. There's so many complicated factors at play and, and, and that's why I hesitate to, and you know, up front, I am by no means claiming that go get, get yourself a patent and then just retire and sail off into the horizon, everything's perfect. That's not the way that it works. Um, but by the same token, be very careful about what people might say about how patents work, how IP rights work, about whether patents are the most fantastic thing in the world or whether they're useless uh, because like in any, as we know, any anecdotal discussion that you have with people, we just don't know about all of the circumstances. So, I, and I don't know, I, I'm aware of that innovation. I thought it was pretty cool actually. I, it is, seems like a great innovation, but I have no idea about what patents they have on foot whether they even have granted patent protection. This is the other thing. They may have applied for patents. It doesn't mean that they have 
granted claims in Australia. They may have granted claims in Australia. They may not have granted claims elsewhere or vice versa. They may have granted US patents, which are going to do, do you no good in Australia. So without knowing those details, I, I can't really answer the question in any substantive way. The other thing is when I'm talking about importation, that's something that you can stop at the border. But if it's someone domestically, internally doing something, that's a different situation. And you're going to have to, as I said, go to them and say, here's my rights, you know, what do you think? Um, and essentially it's complicated because you can be done for unjustified threats if you make an unjustified threat. So, but if you get the right advice and it's very clear that what they're doing infringes your patent, then you get an attorney to write a stern letter on their behalf. I mean, I've dealt with this numerous times and I've done, dealt with it where we're the client on the wrong side of it and where we have to say to our client, basically, I strongly advise that you take this off the market because you're not going to win um, or it's very unlikely that you'll win in a court of law. Now, exactly what the other party does in response to that is you know up to them um but if they continue to flout it then you take them to court and yeah it gets messy for everyone but ultimately you, know, it, you have a right that you know, can be enforced and they can be in a lot of trouble if they haven't respected that it, again though you know it is very challenging and it's a financial burden to get into any kind of court conflict around intellectual property rights. I don't dispute that for a moment. Can I add to that? The question follows, it's a fantastic question. But I guess, conceptually, you don't realise we're talking around the game fiddlesticks. We're talking about the United States very right to We're talking about a bundle of rights that are often sort of quite complex. Because if you think about the United States, the United States has a bundle of rights that are quite complex. And it's a bundle of rights that are quite complex. It's a bundle of rights that are quite complex. And you have a team of lawyers who are aware of all the ends up. Um, with platforms, you know there's a lot of, of e platforms for solving this sort of dispute. So, an area that Tim hasn't spoken about, well, I'm the head of the law school, so I don't think I'm very his professor, he's a lot of So, we're very interested in SRI and But I actually consult the law firm, specialises in this sort of problem as well. My area is like the government side of things. So, one of the things we're finding in Australia is that somebody will go and write a review on a website back in April Parliament, and it's completely unjustifiable. If you take the court, you know, you literally let them train. You put a lot of law. We've now set up some techniques working with everything from WeChat in China, and, and uh, Tim, can I just endorse what you said about why virus the world? You know, probably organizations working in Chinese, Chinese courts are now very responsive. To operate in China, it's more to do so this relationship that I call party member and I'm playing a lot of work in China but you know, they're, they are, they're maturing in this is where they say yes and push the possible calls now they're becoming much more responsive at the BME market but I think fund the rights and then I talk to, to Facebook and that's the platform they've got a whole set of, um, of standards like eBay that they actually want to enforce one of the problems is we look at Alibaba China, which is fantastic, but 90% of the goods are fake, and they know it's fake, and you can tell by the price. Whereas eBay, you can say, very well, 90% are valid products, they make hot products, they come from uh, great imports, etc. There's a, it's a different perspective. I think those sort of channels are now very responsive to how we do that process. If, if, in the whole part, I'm not so much talking about the advertising, how much they charge, but the setup costs. But the litigation cost has a four months ten day limit. So that's how it should work. The trial that it will be told, the five day hearing, ten day hearing, etc. And, and again, I'm predominantly talking about Australia rather than trying to make a claim in the US. So it just seems we want some sort of guidance for what we're talking about. But I think, like you suggest again, talking to a team or such like, quite early on to say this is what I'm thinking about, I need to come up with a plan. The other big mistake is those dates. So Tim's fine, five years for this, 10 years for this. So what happens is you forget. So there's now software which enables you to plug in all those dates and send you a reminder, you need to re-register, you need to do this, you need to do that. And again, I'm assuming as a firm, you have yeah. software on tap. Sure. So it's, do you know what I mean? It's a pretty holistic type of thing.
Can, can, one question. Can I provide a practical answer to Danielle's question? Sure. Which is, um, and it's a practical step that I'll talk to you know, all the startups and other stage companies I advise, which is actually protect your right to operate. So when you register your company with ASIC, register your business name with ASIC, go and see Tim at IP Gateway, register your trademark around the name that you intend to operate your business with the product, and register the logo around that, and also grab the domain, the URL. Yeah. Because you're also, as an early stage company in Australia, protect your right to operate personal domains. And so Facebook looks at trademarks. Yep. It's not really about even bring the design around the hardest stuff, but it's your right to operate your business. So the practical side for early stage and startup companies is it's your, it's your brand to operate. Oh, without so a doubt. Register the business name of asset in addition to the company, register the trademark, register the mark as a logo, make sure you've got the URL, you just Without a doubt, and 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 also from a cost perspective, uh, I mean, I can tell you what our costs would be for patenting if you really want to, um, to know. Our minimum charge is to prepare and file a provisional patent application at the current firm. It's a lot lower than the previous firm. Yeah, five thousand and five dollars for a PCT application. We would normally charge between nine and ten thousand dollars. Uh, patent cooperation treaty. Um, beyond then, to enter individual jurisdictions, you're, you encounter agent fees, and so largely it's dictated by how much those agent fees are. If you go to a jurisdiction that requires translation, there's thousands of dollars in, in translation fees alone, so there's going to be expenses there. But, you know, it, well, firstly, you have to have a business strategy, and it may not involve patent protection. That's fine. Um, but if you're serious about protecting your rights and operating and, you know, you realise that in the absence of patent protection, then you're going to be very vulnerable, well, then that's the path that you are going to have to take or else be exposed to those vulnerabilities. Um, so it's just, just the way that it works. Is it a perfect system? No. Is it a perfect world? No, but that's the way that it works. Uh, Thanks, Tim. You mentioned that copyright automatically applies to things like software. Can do, yeah. Can do. How does that process sit when software uses third-party imagery and databases to provide a known product? It's an incredibly complex aspect of the law, and, and I, it's not my area and also it's highly jurisdiction specific i mean there is this kind of gray area between well wait should copyright be uh, should it apply to software or do we need other bespoke you know um forms of protection around software and in the us at the moment there's complicated you know machinations going on around how that might be protected but in Australia, at the moment at least, the state of play is that your code is, is essentially like a, a written work, if you like, and so you will have copyright rights in the particular presentation of, of your code. Uh, if someone, if I, well, not that I can program, but if I could, if I take your, your code and I rewrite it to do the same thing using my language, if you like, um, then, you know, your, your, your rights don't extend to covering that because I've presented it in a different, in a different form. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's answered your question, but, yeah. We got a final question? Or... Uh, yep, so innovation patents. Um, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, there's... There's a lot of tense negotiations going on, basically. Um, it was looking inevitable that they would be lost, and then there was a lot of pushback, and currently the state of play is that they're good for now. Um, we don't entirely know how long that's going to last for, but there is no impending time at which innovation patents, you know, cease to exist within Australia. So, yeah, that's... Yes, but that's been revoked. There's no, there's no um, explicit timeline for patent innovation patents to not. 
Uh, I'd have to go and look at the, the specific. Well, it was proposed. Oh, I didn't ask you. I didn't just it, it was, oh yeah, and to be fair, it wasn't legislation enacted. It was recommendations of of the Productivity Commission that said scrap this, and in no uncertain terms, uh, there wasn't legislation to scrap it enacted. But it was like, oh well, they're going to scrap it. The Productivity Commission's told them to do it, but then it just other parties got involved, and it didn't come to that. So there was there was never. It was looking like. There'll be no innovation patents beyond this time, but there was never any legis as unless I'm 99.9. You've got me doubting myself now. Amendments, second set. Yep. That's where I thought that was going to happen, but maybe that's to get the final because it wasn't a Yeah, I'm I'm almost certain. Prove me wrong, but I'm almost certain there was never legislation enacted to cancel the innovation patents. Yeah, yeah. All right, Tim. Thank you very much.